Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Joint Center for Extreme Photonics uh, seminar series. Um, and today we have uh, Ben Sussman from the National Research Council. We have Jeff Lundin from University of Ottawa, and we have uh, Connor Kupchak, who uh, was uh, with JSEP, is now a professor at uh, Carleton University. So, Ben, I believe you are first up. Absolutely, and let me turn on sharing. Uh, okay, we can see that. So I've gone uh, full screen there. Is that okay for everyone? Yep. As, as David mentioned, I'll go first. I'm a NRC research officer um, uh, in the Ultrafast Quantum Photonics Group and also the, the program director for the current uh, Quantum Photonics uh, Program. Uh, I'll go first with a little a little more overview, uh, then, then Jeff will go, and then Connor, who was the JSEP uh, uh, PDF, um, and now we're delighted to have a, a new uh, a quantum colleague uh, in Ottawa, um, is, uh, is joining now from his position at Carleton. Uh, so there's, there's a long uh, history uh, of the relationship between NRC uh, and, and U Ottawa, and it dates back pre-1990s, but uh, I arrived as an undergrad student in the 1990s uh, uh, at NRC in the uh, Femto Second Science uh, group of Paul Corkums. I was working then uh, uh, with Albert, and uh, shortly after that time, and Paul can, can correct me on the details here, a uh, white paper was uh, developed that actually outlined the importance of the relationship between NRC and U Ottawa. Um, and it really sketched out a lot of things that came uh, to fruition. There was the substantive uh, lab, the jazz lab uh, that was formed. Over time, there was an increased growth of uh, adjunct professors. I think there's an excess of 12 now just with our research center alone or our institute alone. I think maybe even 16 with physics across NRC. Um, a significant number of uh, students, PDFs and fellows, and of course JSEP in the last year uh, has been formed. Uh, and that was, a, you know, very much a, a celebration of existing relationships and an opportunity um, uh, uh, to grow a new one. So it's been a pleasure to, to watch this sort of happen as, as Paul sketched out in some sense. Uh, and it's, it's really bright um, looking forward. Um, so one of the things that's really been exciting in, in the last year actually is, is a new lab. So JSEP isn't just uh, virtual, there's, there's the Jazz Lab, which is a physical joint uh, lab, and now there's a, a new lab that's being developed. It was a two and a half million dollar funding, uh, provided a significant amount from NRC and also from U Ottawa and the other funding uh, agencies relevant there. And, and a huge number of people participated in that, including uh, Chabot and Fred and Duncan and Phil. Um, and, uh, and, and Jeff and Ibrahim will have a footprint at the, the 100 uh, Sussex location and it's also done in collaboration um, with, uh, with uh, Lindsay LeBlanc and Christoph Simon um, in, in Alberta. And, and again, it's about high dimensional quantum key um, information, encoding new types of information spectrally, looking at uh, channel capacity, um, uh, looking at noise and things like uh, turbulence. And so that's really an exciting big project. Um, uh, going uh, going forward. Uh, uh, just a little layout of, of what this looks like. It's actually going to be, I think, around 1,200 uh, square feet. It's a really big new uh, uh, footprint uh, retrofitting one of the previous uh, labs. And we have a whole bunch of goodies uh, coming in that I, I won't go through in, in, in full detail, uh, but some, some OPOs and ultra-fast lasers. And increasingly, we're using um, uh, single uh, photon uh, detectors, and so that's a big part of what's uh, going into that lab. And we're really excited to have um, uh, Jeff uh, and, and Ibrahim with that, uh, that footprint um, in 100 Sussex. Uh, the work that I wanna talk about today, I, I should thank all of these people who have uh, uh, participated in it. So um, all of these individuals uh, contributed in some way to what I'll be talking about. I did wanna highlight uh, three uh, in particular, uh, Chabot, who actually is a JSEP member, but also Phil and Duncan, who are very much shadow members, uh, working behind the scenes um, to, uh, to make sure that all of this work in JSEP actually uh, uh, is, is moving forward. So you say uh, tomato, I say uh, tomato. Um, uh, so the title of our center is the Extreme uh, Photonics uh, Center. 
Um, and uh, so there are really two different extremes here. And Jeff uh, made this delightful uh, calculation, which is that a uh, one light bulb, 100 watt light bulb produces 10 billion billion photons uh, per second. Um, and so you can imagine if you have femtosecond or attosecond pulses and you're, uh, you know, depending on the, the duty cycle you're dealing with, you're talking about a tremendous number of photons per unit time passing uh, through something. And so that even though they're an individual photon can be quite uh, wimpy, uh, when you have that number of photons, you can really drive systems uh, very strongly. Uh, at the other end of the, the spectrum, if you have uh, a candle uh, in Ottawa and you look at the solid angle in Halifax, you get about one photon uh, per second. So tremendous um, variation in, uh, in those uh, conditions. And, and a lot of the work that we do sort of combines those two limits. We use extremely strong uh, nonlinear uh, pulses to control light matter systems. Uh, and then we're often uh, then trying to control the single photon or the quantum level system with those. And so there's sort of a, a challenge there with making sure that the noise of one uh, doesn't uh, affect uh, the, the noise of, of another. Uh, there tend to be sort of uh, a taxonomy of looking at quantum optics and quantum information science, and uh, I'll just review that uh, very, very quickly. Um, there tend to be sort of three different slices of it, uh, quantum communications, uh, quantum sensing, imaging, and metrology, which, which can be either thought of really as three different things or, or, or three related things, and, and, and simulation and, and computing. Uh, you know, quantum communications, of course, is about the idea of absolute secure communications and where classical communications uh, you know, tends to rely on uh, mathematical uh, robustness, uh, for example, to prevent compromise. A, a quantum, uh, a, a quantum link uses some sort of law of nature to to avoid that compromise. And uh, so, for example, um, you know, the no cloning theorem uh, says that you can't copy quantum information, and so that means that nobody can sort of copy your your um, your your information and compromise your signal. Uh, that way. So there are many other uh, advances beyond that, but that's sort of the general idea that there's a, so there's a fundamental law of physics that you're, uh, you're trying to get, um, you're trying to get past. Um, uh, sensing uh, is another really important area that, uh, that we're increasingly interested in imaging and measurement. Uh, and, and perhaps the simplest uh, example of that is what happens when you put a laser pulse through a block of glass. Um, uh, typically, you'll get some, some phase shift phi. Um, and uh, however, if you use a non-classical state, uh, an n photon state, for example, say five photons, and you put it in an interferometer and you interfere them, the phase shift that is observed is actually five times uh, or n times the phase shift that you would with, with a classical pulse. And so you can see there starts to be a, a really interesting advantage there to use those to sort of amplify and get past barriers that you uh, have in classical sensing. So if you reach some sort of fundamental limit, like the shot noise limit, you know, pushing past that. I think Jeff's going to talk about an example uh, with LIGO uh, afterwards. Um, uh, quantum computing and simulation, uh, again, that's the idea of, of, of certain uh, calculations being exponentially uh, faster um, on quantum systems. Uh, there are a tremendous number of different platforms looking at those systems. We're sort of uh, optics people, and actually we've been interestingly working increasingly with a company in, 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 in Toronto called Xanadu that's looking at um, uh, quantum optical approaches, and there's some interesting new technology for that. So, so one of the big motivating themes uh, in quantum information science and quantum optics right now is this idea of the quantum internet. Or the quantum internet uh, of things. And, and this is the idea that you might build a distributed uh, quantum system. Uh, and it would have a number of different uh, components. It would have uh, links and they may be free space or they may be underwater or they may be to satellite. Um, at nodes, there would be uh, some kind of processing capability. It could be remedial processing or it could be full-blown uh, quantum computing. And again, there could be a whole uh, bunch of different uh, uh, platforms there. There's a lot of expertise, for example, in SPIN uh, in, in, in Ottawa. Uh, we're, we're more interested in the, uh, the photonic and ultra-fast work. And of course, at those, those nodes, you might also have um, uh, sensors as well that could be point sensors or, in principle, could be distributed sensors to the, to the other nodes. 
there have been a couple of real articles uh, on these systems as of late, and there are a whole host of, of, of applications that, that motivate this work. Secure communications, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, sensing over distances, um, a really interesting idea that, that Otto has some expertise on um, in, in things like blind quantum computing. And that's the idea, for example, that uh, you're a client and you want to use a quantum computer in the cloud, uh, but you don't want the quantum computer to know what it is that you're asking them to calculate. Um, uh, so that's a really interesting problem for, for privacy and the same with databases, um, synchronizing clocks, uh, linking together um, computers to make uh, super quantum computers and a whole host of really um, interesting uh, applications. So, so our work tends to look at building the various different components that might be important to support um, uh, this kind of distributed uh, quantum system. And so you can imagine that in order for that to be realized, you'd really need uh, a large uh, uh, selection of abilities to transduce and connect and link nodes. So uh, the next two slides are probably uh, the most two important of, of the, uh, the talk that I want to uh, mention, and you can sort of go to sleep after that or the wake up for Jeff's uh, and Connor's, please. Um, and, and that's the idea of using short laser pulses uh, in, in quantum optics. So, so the most important thing uh, in quantum information uh, uh, science and, and, and the application of it anyways, is, is this idea of, of coherence and quantum coherence and making sure that that's preserved. And so there is a considerable amount of effort that goes into preserving coherence in these systems. And, and, and you can cool your system, you can isolate it, you can connect it. But if you're trying to control your system in the presence of an environment, uh, there's always going to be this, this loss, and then you lose the quantum advantage that, that you want for all these other processes. However, if you're not cared about um, uh, absolute uh, storage time, and you're only interested in the number of steps you can take, you can just operate really, really uh, quickly uh, before systems uh, decohere. And so ultra-fast lasers and, and ultra-fast systems tend to be perfect uh, partners in that sense, and they allow you to control and process information very, very quickly um, uh, before a system can decohere. And, and I'll just be a little more explicit about it here. You know, if you have some measure of coherence versus time and your system's falling, uh, falling down there, decohering, even if it's incredibly fast, picoseconds or nanoseconds, you can still perform a significant number of operations if you have a, a femtosecond uh, laser pulse. There are applications where you want extremely long storage time and state of the art now is, you know, sort of measured in seconds and minutes, tens of minutes. Um, but if you're okay not thinking about those applications, you can still do a lot of really interesting work uh, at these time scales. So that's, um, that's an important uh, uh, message. So we uh, work in uh, a lot of different um, light matter uh, systems, um, and some of them are depicted here. So typically you're looking for, in quantum optics, a lambda system, a three-level system that allows you to do some sort of processing. The sort of uh, canonical, I don't know if people can see my mouse, the canonical one there is at the top, uh, which is, uh, you know, light pulse going in and um, interacting with uh, um, a lattice system in this case. So that's the vibrations in a bulk material, phonons, and some light coming out. So we do work, for example, in the vibrations of, of diamond um, and, and using the Raman state uh, basically as the shelving state for that, that three-level system. There are a lot of other ultrafast systems that are really interesting. Um, molecular gases, for example, the rotations and vibrations of, of hydrogen and nitrogen um, are, are, uh, are amenable to use as, as uh, effective three-level systems. We look in bulk uh, glasses and liquids and increasingly interested um, in fiber. The, the, the challenge, uh, of course, when you wanna have nonlinear interactions is you tend to require very high um, intensities if you want to control your system and that that drives you for example towards you know kilohertz systems in in free space the interesting thing about fibers is you can really reduce uh, the intensities that are um, required but still have strong interactions and uh and that means that you can use higher repetition rate lasers like like megahertz uh, systems versus kilohertz and since a lot of quantum optics experiments are coincidence based uh, you, you're typically looking at probabilities that get multiplied. So if you have three events, you know, it's the probability of those three events. It can become a very small number, 
So you really want to be able to do these things with um, with uh, fast uh, repetition rates. And so there's a, a picture here of um, of uh, of a fiber. This is actually a random number generator um, based on a KTP uh, uh, waveguide. And, and we've also been working with uh, Chabad in theory, thinking about um, potentially uh, new systems. So, um, so the other way of thinking about uh, these things, that's sort of the light matter perspective, is looking at really the components again uh, that, that are required to articulate uh, a, a quantum internet or the or some fraction of it. Uh, perhaps the um, one of the most important components, anyways, is something called a quantum memory, and 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 that's a lot like a classical memory that stores uh, zeros and ones. Uh, a quantum memory can take a, uh, a photonic state with a certain amount of quantum information. It can map it into a matter state and at some time later release it. Importantly, that outcoming state has to contain the same. Uh, amount of uh, quantum information, the same quantum information as the, the, the input state. Um, and so it's similar to a classical memory, uh, but it has some important differences in that it has to store quantum information. So you have problems that, that, that you know, you can't measure uh, the system, otherwise that sort of collapses the, the, the information. And so you have to think very carefully about how you handle noise uh, in these systems so that they can operate um, as, as a storage system. And so they're used uh, for synchronizing, but um, uh, just and buffering, just as they are in, in the classical case, but you can actually think about them as their own devices for um, processing quantum information uh, as well. And that, that's particularly the case if you're not interested in long storage time, and you can do a lot of operations um, with uh, with that system. So, and as as I mentioned, uh, one of the challenges, right, is is uh, fending off. Uh, for example, uh, decoherence and looking to hybridize uh, different systems. And so it's really important there to be able to interface different systems. You may have a quantum system that you want to utilize in the visible, but you may want to transmit that over telecom uh, in the near IR. And so you're looking to modify photons to interface. Uh, it could be two different quantum systems and you, know, you have to get the colors matched and the bandwidths matched. So importantly, this has to be done with single photons. And your goal there really is not to lose any quantum information or not to lose any um, energy if it's at the, if it's at the same uh, wavelength. And so some of the things that we've been working on in different systems is, is bandwidth modification, increasing the bandwidth of single photons, decreasing uh, the bandwidth of single photons, and then also uh, frequency conversion, uh, which can be particularly challenging if you're making small frequency shifts. And that's something that we've been able to use these quantum memories uh, basically, by modifying the the output um, readout, we can actually do frequency uh, conversion. Um, switching and routing obviously important for uh, for for networks uh, as well. Uh, and oops, that's my screen there. Um, and uh, and we're working there, for example, using the the Kerr effect for all optical. Uh, routing, so using intense extreme control pulses to induce nonlinearities, current nonlinearities, uh, which allow us to, to switch polarization. And that's increasingly important as we use uh, time, uh, time encoding of this, uh, this information. Uh, Slow Light was another really interesting project actually that uh, Chabot proposed and we did experimentally, uh, again, looking at buffering for, for synchronizing uh, of, of pulses. Uh, and we also worked uh, some time ago on random number generators, again, harnessing the uh, quantum uh, nature of, uh, of, of our systems to generate random numbers that are used in cryptographic keys, uh, something that you can't do with a classical algorithm because no classical algorithm is truly random. It's always um, uh, deterministic. Um, so, so as I mentioned, uh, there are a host of applications uh, that we look at driven uh, increasingly by this idea of, uh, of a quantum uh, network. Um, so the sensing applications, the comms and computing, and I'll talk just for a second on the next uh, few slides about uh, quantum uh, illumination or quantum LIDAR. And I'll just mention, you know, we've also been working with Ibrahim's group. This is an underwater tank uh, at NRC. Flume uh, doing QKD in those systems, broadly looking at general uh, photonic signal processing control in these systems and, and, and a lot of work increasingly on um, uh, 
uh, uh, QKD and sources and, and, and processing for those systems. So I'll just uh, choose one example before, um, before turning the mic over to Jeff, which is an interesting project uh, that we've been uh, working on uh, that Duncan's been leading uh, on quantum illumination. And so with traditional um, radar, right, you have this, this idea of a, of a transmitter that, that bounces off your, your target and some signal comes back and you measure uh, the intensity. The, the approach here, is, is that that's particularly useful when you have small uh, signals uh, on the order of single photons or less, and you have backgrounds is, is actually to take advantage of the correlations that you have uh, in quantum mechanics. So um, uh, some spontaneous four-wave mixing or, or any um, uh, pair source can be used. And one of the pairs is used to illuminate um, your, your target uh, and then instead of just measuring the intensity clicks uh, when information uh, comes back, uh, you measure the correlations. And the correlations are stronger in quantum mechanics. Uh, and so you can actually get an enhancement factor. And just uh, down here, you see, uh, for example, this is the classical illumination, this is the quantum illumination. And you can see that uh, in the presence of the noisy background, we actually get a much, much better signal. And that's reasonably uh, easy to understand uh, the classical uh, signal to noise ratio is really just the ratio of, of the probability of you getting your signal back divided by that background, whatever it is, and eta being some efficiency. Uh, in, in a correlated measurement, a quantum correlated measurement, um, you're looking actually at that, that correlation. And so uh, the, uh, the ratio of those two gives you that sort of enhancement factor. And that ratio is the G2 uh, between those two modes, the signal mode um, and, and the herald mode. And that gives you this, uh, this enhanced uh, uh, ratio. And so you can see that uh, it's quite easy to get factors of 10 or, uh, or even 100 uh, enhancement um, by using these correlations instead of straight um, uh, intensity uh, measurements. So I'll just uh, wrap up by saying we're extending that now to, to imaging with a new type of camera that we've, um, we've got. I know Ying Wen is not sleeping at nights. He's having dreams because it's sitting in a box at NRC waiting for, for the, the virus to pass so we can get and use it. But we're looking at now multiplexing that. Uh, we've done some work spectrally multiplexing it and we're gonna continue um, to extend that. And uh, let me just say thank you. And I can't actually see a clock here, so I don't know if I'm under or over. Um, but uh, thank you very much. Happy to answer some questions now. Or we can save them for the end. Okay, I think we're going to do the questions at the end. And I think you, ha you have to stop screen sharing for me to start. Uh, okay. All right. Should be yours. Okay. Can you see? Anybody see that? Yep, we can see that. Okay, that's cool okay great. Okay, so uh, okay, so just to go over uh, a few of the things that, uh, that Ben talked about that my lab uh, particularly focuses on. Uh, so one is quantum metrology. Uh, ben mentioned that a particular example of that. Here's uh, probably the most famous example of that. This is uh, LIGO. So this is a four kilometer uh, long uh, Michelson interferometer that senses very incredibly small uh, changes in the length of the arms to sense gravitational waves. And uh, this year they upgraded it um, to use squeeze lights. So that's a quantum state of light in, in one of the uh, output ports. And uh, that allows them to uh, increase their sensitivity by a factor of three, which allows them to increase the volume of space that they're sensitive to by a factor of nine. So if there's any sort of black hole collision in that, in that volume of space, they'll, they'll now be able to sense, uh, sense it. Uh, and that's now online and they're reporting that uh, they're, they've changed from uh, detecting uh, gravitational wave events every month to now detecting them every week. So now this is really you know, turning into an observatory and uh, this is just the first step of adding squeeze light. They're gonna have another upgrade that'll um, add an even better state of squeeze light into it and, and further improve its, its sensitivity. So uh, quantum metrology is, is sort of has two facets. One is the, what I just told you about, 
trying to come up with systems that improve the, the, the resolution of current sensors. The other facet is more theoretical and that's just establishing what are the limits to measurement given some resource, saying, say uh, the power in one of the arms of, uh, of the interferometer. Um, the other part uh, that Ben talked about that my lab uh, really focuses on is quantum information and quantum computing. Um, so the main applications there are factoring large uh, numbers, that's uh, Shor's algorithm, and of course internet encryption is based on this. So if you can factor large numbers, you can start decrypting messages on the internet. So the military is obviously interested in that. Uh, but probably for humanity, a better use would be uh, simulating quantum systems like large molecules that we can't simulate right now, uh, for instance, drugs. And finally, uh, there's actually quite a few other applications, uh, for instance, solving systems of linear equations, as long as they're uh, particular cases. And what's depicted here in the background is not an electronic circuit, but a photonic circuit. Those you know, artistic uh, glowing balls traveling along these lines are actually supposed to be photons traveling along waveguides. And that's what I'm gonna really uh, tell you a little bit more about in this talk. <laughs> So some more background on my lab. Uh, it's six years old at the University of Ottawa. Uh, I study three things, fundamental issues in quantum physics. So I'm well known for doing this direct measurement of the wave function. I also study the quantum physics of measurement and entanglement, uh, quantum metrology. So I sort of told you about that a little bit. I recently have been focusing on something called weak value amplification, which actually doesn't use quantum states, but it uses the ideas from quantum metrology, the theoretical ideas, to come up with new ways to do measurements even in classical optics. Uh, so this is a, a technique to amplify small signals. John Howell at the University of Rochester really made this famous by showing that he could detect, using this, this technique, he could detect an angular shift of a beam that's equivalent to the size of the hair at a distance of the moon from the Earth. So we've really done some work, uh, experimental and theoretical work looking at that. Um, and then finally, quantum information with photons. So I'm gonna tell you about uh, doing universal transformations. I also look at universal measurements uh, and uh, the generation of quantum light, which is what Connor is gonna uh, tell you about. Okay, so uh, going back to that uh, glowing photon circuit that I showed you uh, a couple slides ago, that's really an example of linear optics quantum computing. And uh, this can sort of be traced back to this paper by Reck and Zeilinger, where they showed that if you put a photon in a superposition of uh, modes, actually, let me turn on my laser pointer here. Uh, yeah, so if you put a photon and it's in a superposition of being in these beams, so there's an amplitude for each one of these, uh, being in each one of these paths, then you can transform that uh, photon using a network of beam splitters and phase shifters. So the dark things are beam splitters and the small uh, thin things are phase shifters. And if they have variable reflectivity and variable uh, phase, then you can implement any transformation that you want on that state. So if that state's a vector, you can transform it to any vector allowed by quantum mechanics. And that transformation is called a unitary transformation and it's just a complex matrix. <laughs> So uh, this is really the basis for quite a few things now. Uh, people have implement, implemented lot, quantum logic gates, the things that you build quantum computers with, so a controlled NOT gate. They've done something called boson sampling that lets you estimate the permanent of a matrix, something that's known to be hard to do on a, on a normal computer. Uh, even in, so, so this was first shown in, in quantum computing context, but now it's really taken off for photonic classical computing, and in particular, uh, people are using it for implementing neural networks. So neural networks take up a lot of our uh, computing power right now, even as a, as a total, a fraction of the total. And a big part of that is just multiplying matrices. So uh, here we have a network of optical elements that implements a, a matrix transformation on our state. If you just concatenate two in a row, then you multiply those matrices. And so people actually now have, uh, there's a couple of commercial companies that are trying to do this and to multiply matrices really quickly so that we don't have to do it electronically. So one way of looking at this uh, system is as, a, as layers of phase shifters and, and beam splitters. And that's really how, so nobody's actually implemented this in free space with real, um, you know, uh, discrete uh, beam splitters and phase shifters. Instead, they've done it with integrated optical uh, circuits. <laughs> So here, here's an example, and these layers of beam splitters and phase shifters now are just lines parallel. So this is actually 
is out of uh, the group of Ian Walmsley, where Ben and I actually uh, both worked. And this was the project I was working on. It took a long time to come to fruition. It came to fruition after I left. Um, and basically what they do, did here is they divided up that circuit into modules so that they could just make two layers at a time and then glue them together. The key thing I want you to look at though, so, so this, this now does, uh, if you can control these phase shifters, the beam splitters are now fixed in this scenario. You just have to control the phase shifters. Um, so they're just fixed 50-50 beam splitters. If you control the phase shifters, you can implement a, a general unitary matrix with this, this circuit now. And what we did in my group is we showed how you could do this in another way. So one way to look at the beam splitters is as a mixing element that mixes the amplitudes from different modes um, and different states. Another way we can do mixing in optics is using a Fourier transform. So a Fourier transform will take one mode and spread it into all the other modes, unlike a beam splitter. So what we showed is a way to map this onto uh, iterating between Fourier transforms as their mixing elements and then still just phase shifting each mode and then Fourier transform and then phase shifting and so on. So you could also impl implement a unitary matrix in this way. Uh, and in fact, something similar had already been done and we knew about this, um, but it wasn't really used for making unitaries. It was used for doing uh, what we call in optics mode conversions. So converting from say a Gaussian mode to a, a Laguerre Gauss mode or Hermite Gauss mode. Uh, and the way they did it is to do the Fourier transform, they used a curved mirror. So curved mirror in optics performs a Fourier transform on light so that the position of the, the, the transverse momentum of the light becomes the position one focal length later. And at that one focal length distance, you put uh, a spatial light modulator, which is just an array of pixels that can phase shift at every point in space by controllable amounts controlled by your electronics. And uh, instead of doing it on a line, they just reflect off of different uh, points of their SLM. And they do it over and over again. And what they show is they can convert between different modes. So for here, here, if you look on the right, uh, they start off at the first plane with the Gaussian modes. So this is just looking at the transverse intensity and flat phase. And then on the second plane, it becomes crazy and then slowly converges into uh, a Hermite gas mode at the output. So that's just by, the only thing they control here is the phases at each reflection. So we wanna do something similar, but we wanna use it for a unitary transformation. And uh, we wanna go back to this beam-like uh, architecture where you have a photon in the superposition of different beams. And this allows you to use the dimensionality of your SLM uh, array much more wisely, let's say. So here we'd have a, a line of beams. The photon could be in uh, a superposition of being in any of those beams. And then we take a Fourier transform by stepping down the, the SLM. And we can step down many times. So now if we have n pixels across and we do n steps down, we have n by n elements and we're using the full dimensionality of the, of the SLM properly to implement the same dimensionality unitary matrix. So we think this is a, a, a wise way to go if you want to implement uh, unitary transformations where, where you have to actually worry about this, these control um, concepts. Um, the optics of doing this is quite actually quite tricky because you need to come up with a way of slowly stepping down your SLM. So this is actually on the right is actually a picture of our, uh, an incoming beam slowly stepping down our SLM. And this is a picture on the, on the left is our setups. We're coming in. We've, reflect at a small angle, and then we go back and forth between our curved mirror and our SLM. But now instead of just hitting, like going around in a circle, say, on our SLM, we go down step by step, and our states are effectively one dimensional along the, along the X direction. So, uh, so we'd like to do this for N beams, but of course you always want to start off uh, with something simple. So we started off with, uh, with just two beams. Can we do this with just two modes, uh, the photon in the superposition of two modes? And we showed that we could. Um, so this is just an example of uh, uh, it doing a transformation. If you have only two modes, then the most universal transformation you can do on your state is that of a, a standard beam splitter that has a variable reflectivity and phase at its output. So here we're just, as an example, showing a 50-50 uh, beam splitter. There's no beam splitter in the setup. There's just an SLM and a mirror. Uh, but we come in with uh, their first plane with uh, our photon or light in the, in the top beam, 
and by the time we exit the, the last plane, we have two beams equally split. And the same thing happens for the for the bottom mode. So now we'd like to take this to more more states. But uh, but just to drop that line, I'm going to tell you about a different direction we took it in that shows you that how how wide the applications of these kind of concepts can be. So while we were doing this, we realized that effectively what we're doing when we're doing this Fourier transform is we're going back and forth between position and momentum space, transverse position, transverse momentum. And we asked ourselves, well, why do we want, why do we have to use a mirror to do this, a curved mirror or a lens or something? Why can't we just directly alter the light in, alter the, the momentum properties of the light? Uh, and this is very akin to ideas in Fourier optics. So in Fourier optics, uh, you have a, a general light field coming in and you divide it up into plane waves. These plane waves are the different K uh, values in this, in this uh, wave function. So our question is, can we directly phase shift each plane wave without having to use a curved mirror? Um, so now once we've set that as our goal, uh, we need some sort of application to aim for. And what we decided to aim for was the easiest that we could think of, just uh, free space, the transformation that free space does. So free space applies this phase factor to every plane wave that comes through. Every plane wave with each, each plane wave has a different K and it applies that phase uh, factor. So what, what exactly are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to create the effect of propagation through a distance d effective, so a slab of space of d effective, and compress that into a distance d. That's much smaller, hopefully. So how do we do that? Well, we're starting off with a plate architecture, and that gives us a lot of advantages, because that means that uh, because the plate does not vary along the x or y directions, the part of the phase um, that corresponds to those directions is automatically conserved. So it'll do exactly what you want it to do in free space. And the only thing we have to worry about is the Z part. And uh, the Z phase that we have to apply is just this, this angularly dependent uh, phase. So we asked ourselves what homogeneous media could possibly implement this phase. Is there some sort of homogeneous media that could do this? Uh, and we realized that a uniaxial crystal, if you a negative uniaxial crystal, if you put the axis along Z, would do this. Now, this is not a very normal way to use a, a uniaxial crystal, so this might be why people haven't really noticed this before. So what we did is we tried to image a print, uh, an Emily Carr print, through a crystal, and we just took it in and out. And we saw, does it decrease the space you need for the image to form, or does it increase it, or does it do nothing? So we added it, or sorry, without it, we found that the image comes to focus at uh, what we call z equals zero, and then uh, and then uh, oh, let me just stop that. And then so we so we add it, and we find that the focus comes uh, 3.4 millimeters closer to the to the print than it did without it. So it's actually decreasing the space that it needs that we need for the uh, the image to come to, into focus. Unlike putting in a shorter lens, this doesn't change the magnification. So we looked at the magnification, it was exactly the same in, in both cases. So uh, just as a, a last thing, we also tried doing this, and this is really our goal, is to do this in a very thin plate, not a calcite crystal, but actually make it out of a multi-layer multi uh, multi stack, uh, in which we can design it to have this phase, and it turns out that you can. And we modeled this in ComSol, and now we're looking at better designs, and then we're going to try and actually make it. And we modeled it, and we focused our beams through it, and the model told us that, it, indeed, they focus closer to the plate than, than you'd expect. So this really brings up the possibility of a monolithic uh, universal spatial transformation device, something that could do this neural uh, network computing or could do um, uh, quantum computing as well. Uh, more uh, in line with what we're going to be trying to do in the JSEP lab and, and in line with what uh, the expertise at NRC is, you can also do this in time and frequency. So you just, again, have to go between two Fourier pairs of parameters. And in this case, it's going to be time and frequency. In time, you can phase shift by just using an electro-optic modulator. And in frequency, you just use a pulse shaper, so a grating and, and an SLM again, and then another grating. Uh, and so if you 
go back and forth between those, you can also implement a unitary transformation, but now it's between uh, frequency time modes, not spatial modes. And of course, if you really want to capitalize on the full uh, power of the photon, full, full power of the quantum particle that the photon is, you want to take advantage of all four degrees of freedom simultaneously. So doing polarization manipulation, time frequency manipulation, and spatial uh, manipulation at the same time in a completely arbitrary and, and, uh, uni and universal way. Okay, so that's it. And uh, so now you're gonna hear about how to make uh, particular uh, types of quantum states and nonlinear optics and fibers uh, from Connor. I'll stop screen sharing. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Jeff and Ben for that handoff. Let's see if I could do this. PowerPoint's not coming up. Why not? Oh, here we go. There we go. All right. All right. Uh, so it just takes a few seconds to load here. All right, great. Thank you. Um, so, Yes, I'm um, at uh, Carleton University, but before that, I was a postdoc uh, working with Jeff and Ben in uh, JSEP. And so I'm going to be talking about the project I was working there. And um, so this is kind of like the title of all the of all the aspects of that talk, or sorry, of that work. And so for a mixing of cylindrical vector beams and optical fibers. So maybe a, a bunch of terms there which are not understood or how they fit together, but we go through uh, each of them and kind of sort them out and how it all tied together. So uh, this work focused on um, well, one aspect of um, quantum computing, or sorry, um, quantum information and quantum communications, and that is producing an entangled light source. So this has um, many applications for, um, say, quantum key distribution. And there's many different ways in which people uh, produce entangled light sources, um, which um, has all these advantages. And one of them, which uh, maybe, maybe people here have heard about, which is uh, structured light. And so there are many, um, different uh, types of structured light, uh, but basically what it means is that we have, uh, let me turn on my uh, laser pointer like Jeff did. Oh. Oh. Sorry, did something I didn't want to do there. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, um, so you know, so essentially, what this means is structure light it means that we have a a structure to the spatial mode of the light. Um, sorry, is there subtitles coming on now? Jeez, how did I turn that on? There we go. Okay, great. Um, so you know, we have some sort of either intensity or um, polarization distribution as we look at the beam is coming head on at us imagine like like a laser beam coming at us and if we're not going to look at it directly but if you were to image it for instance we have some some sort of uh, distribution to it and um so this can be um advantageous in many different applications such as increasing the bandwidth for communication purposes because now we have additional degrees of freedom that we could utilize such as uh, how the intensity distribution looks or how the polarization mapping looks and so, and also in applications like quantum key distribution, this could be advantageous for things like um, you don't, it's, you could have a rotational invariance, right? So what this means is that we don't need to set a particular reference frame between say the emitter of our uh, photon source and our receiver, right? It goes through any rotation, we can still identify what kind of state it is and what kind of information it's holding. Um, so this work that we did uh, focused on a specific type of structured light called uh, cylindrical vector modes. And these are of interest because they're actually the eigenmodes of a weakly guiding uh, ring fiber. So what this means is if we put these modes uh, through a fiber, the same state's gonna come out. We don't need to worry about, say, the polarization being distorted. And what we looked at specifically with this is if this could be uh, serve as a new source of entangled photons to use for these communication purposes. So this is, you know, has it because it's, and 
you think it's naturally suited for this because it be it's eigenmode of the fiber and we want to transmit photon through fiber. It's a very con convenient way to do this. So uh, when it comes to structured light, um, there's many different ways you can um, add structure to it. So one that maybe people have heard about here is the angular momentum of light. Uh, so light can have uh, orbital angular momentum, OAM, or spin angular momentum. And so the orbital angular momentum arises from a helical phase variation about the propagation axis. And so what this means is that if we have our light beam um, coming straight at us and we're able to look at the phase at different points um, in the azimuthal plane, if it rotated from say zero degrees to two pi degrees in terms of phase, that would be an orbital angular momentum of plus one. We could also go from say zero to four pi, that would be plus two. And likewise, we go say zero to minus two pi, so it'd be negative one. So this is represented um, as an exponential, e to the I, um, exponential of I L, which is your angular momentum number, and the azimuthal angle phi. Uh, when it comes to spin angular momentum, this is generally described by the polarization of light. So this would mean that if we have right-hand circular, this would have a spin angular momentum of plus one. And if we have left-hand circular, it'd be a spin angular momentum of negative one. Um, so, this leads me to what the structure light that we were using in our work, which was cylindrical vector modes. And so cylindrical vector modes, as the name might imply, they have a cylindrically symmetric intensity profile about the axis and a variable polarization. And they are built of a non-separable combination of spin and orbital angular momentum. So what this means is that say we had uh, one beam that had a right-hand circular polarization shown here, so spin of plus one, and then it had a phase of, um, sorry, an, o, an orbital angular momentum of negative one. So the phase went from zero to negative two pi. And that was superimposed with another beam, which had a spin of negative one and an orbital angular momentum of plus one, so zero to two pi. So if we had, if we superimpose those beams together, we get this kind of unique um, spatial mode, which is known as the radial mode. So you see that we still preserve this donut shape of intensity, which these uh, OAM uh, one beams have in this case. Um, but we have a, um, a radial distribution of the polarization, meaning that the polarization at different points as we go through the plane points in different directions. So this is known as the TM01 uh, mode. And it turns out, so for this work, we were concentrated on the cases of the CV modes where L was equal to one. And that for this, in this, instance, there's four different possibilities. Um, so this was the uh, radial TM01, the azimuthal, which the polarization kind of goes in this circular pattern, and there's a hybrid even and odd. And the way these come about is that you imagine you have, um, you know, your two degrees of freedom of orbital and spin angular momentum. Those could be either aligned or anti-aligned. And then you could also have the case where you have their symmetric. So you have um, a positive combination or a negative combination. So kind of just what I just said is that if you want to now math, uh, represent this mathematically, so in general, if we have a light state containing orbital angular momentum or spin angular momentum, we could represent it as a, a ket vector. So we have these, um, these kind of like quantum numbers where they have the L and the S value and that the CV modes that we're interested in uh, can be uh, represented as non separable combination of these. So mathematically, the radial mode, for instance, the, the L and the spin are anti-aligned. So we have plus L minus one, and it's a symmetrically combined with a uh, negative L and plus one. And then the azimuthal would be the, that same um, anti-alignment, but now anti-symmetric. And then if we have the alignment where L and, or yeah, the L value and the spin have the same, um, or both positive quantities. We have the symmetric combination and the anti-symmetric combination. So those were the modes that we're interested in. Um, so now kind of why we're all doing this is because um, we want to now use this entangled source of photons. So can we actually get entanglement between these modes, produce two, two light beams, which basically we don't know whether or not uh, they're both, um, which one of these four modes they lie into. And of course, uh, Ben, Jeff and I were all experimentalists, so we set to do this in the lab. But what we want to do is we want to see um, if there's another uh, degree of, uh, another degree of freedom, which we can, gen uh, sorry, if we could use this for generating entanglement. 
So uh, the process that we looked at was uh, Fourier mixing. So many people here might have heard of uh, Fourier mixing. So uh, traditionally how this is done is that you have um, four beams, uh, generally two pumps, and they produce a signal in idler. They go into a chi-3 medium. And what happens with Fourier mixing is the two, bumps, the two pumps uh, need to satisfy, uh, produce a signal in idler and satisfy both uh, frequency and momentum conservation. So uh, basically the energy has to be preserved and also phase matching. So the momentum also has to be preserved. So that's, being done, that's been done in many different applications using those uh, momentum and frequency conservation. But when it comes to uh, cylindrical vector beams, uh, this has received limited attention. Uh, so so what we, the question we want to answer is like, if we have these CV beams and we put them in a chi-3 medium and we're getting Fourier mixing, once we satisfy the energy and momentum conservation, is there also additional constraints that we look at where we have to conserve these L and S type quantum numbers or these degree of freedoms? And can we then use, utilize that for producing an entangled photon source? So that's basically the goal, right? Is that we, we look at these, uh, this Fourier mixing, we wanna see now, can we set a set of selection rules um, of these CV modes inside the optical fibers where we have to uh, set guidelines on these L and S values. And then the questions we set up to answer is that, is the OAM L conserved? Is the spin angular momentum S conserved? And what about additional uh, type quantum number, the total angular momentum? So the combination of L and S, is that also conserved? So um, as my point is that we want to, of course, do this experimentally, but before we, we do this in the lab and we need to know what we're gonna look for. So we set out to see if we could actually come up with a uh, theoretical answer or a set of selection rules where we can then go into lab and then look for what we, we tend to expect. Um, so doing this was very mathematical and then in this context, it uh, wouldn't make sense to go through all the mathematical details, but this is just kind of the, the overall method that we, that we went about is that we started with the nonlinear wave equation. Uh, from that, we got the camp coupled amplitude equations for a third order nonlinearity. So we had our, uh, that would uh, be made up of four different beams, our two pumps, our signal and our idler. And then what we did is we looked in the case of perfect phase matching. So we set delta k equal to zero. And then what we ended up with was a bunch of integrals that determine the spatial overlap of the beams. And so what this meant is this, we have this, this overlap integral O and it's equated to, we have this F term, which is the radial overlap. So it's the, the kind of how the intensity of the beams uh, change as you go radially out from the, the axis. Uh, we factored that out. And what we were concerned with was what was left over, which was the azimuthal dependence. Um, so we have our four beams, the two pumps, we have the signal, we have the idler. Uh, we're gonna have a product before, between all those four beams. So that's what these phi functions represent here. They're, they're representing each of our beams. And this contains both the orbital angular momentum information, so our e to the i l phi term, and our uh, spin angular momentum information, so our polarization vectors. So for right-hand circular polarization, it'd be x plus or minus i y over root two. And then what we then do is we then look for the selection rules. How we do that is we look for the case where these uh, overlap integrals are not equal to zero because that would correspond to processes that are now allowed. So that, that's just the general kind of uh, mathematical method. And now without going through the nitty gritty details, I'll just skip to, oh, sorry, um, go to the results. But uh, we wanted to do this for completeness for three different types of modes. Um, so we, um, we looked at simple, simple angular momentum modes, what I call them, or the, the Y modes. And so these are just uh, simple product states of the E i to the L phi term uh, times the spin vector, where our spin vector is right or left-hand circular. Uh, the cylindrical vector modes, which we were um, most interested in this work. Um, so this is just a general way to write those, uh, those uh, four types of uh, modes, which I'd shown on the previous slide. And then the total angular momentum modes. So a, a basis um, which we look at the total angular momentum value and this I was actually made up of both a combination of the CV modes and the Y modes. So we have the, the Z plus and minus states and these correspond to um, the CV, um, two of the CV modes. So basically what this means is that we have um, 
orbital angular momentum plus one, spin angular momentum of negative one, uh, they add up to zero. But uh, we have, they could be symmetric or anti-symmetric, so we call that the, the Z plus or minus. And then we also have the Z uh, plus two and minus two. So these are just correspond to the simple uh, Y states where we have E to the I L phi and our spin vector. So those are the modes we looked at. We put them through our Fourier mixing equations, evaluate the integrals, and then um, came up with our selection rules. So um, summarizing those now, um, so when we look at the simple Y modes, it turns out that um, the spin angular momentum oh, and was and orbital angular momentum were independently conserved. So this means that the, the two uh, spin values of the pump corresponded to the spin values of the idler and the signal. And then likewise, we had the same rule for the orbital angular momentum. And so what this means is that the, the total angular momentum, so the, core, the value of L plus S, wasn't conserved by kind of interchanging between these two variables, like saying like spin angular momentum goes to orbital um, through the Fourier mixing and vice versa. Um, and now we go to the cylindrical vector mode. So that's what we were most interested in. And what we found out here was that um, the, uh, that these processes uh, always have to appear in pairs. Uh, so on the right here are kind of uh, pictorial diagrams of the Fourier mixing instances that were allowed. Uh, so on the top here, we have kind of the trivial case where we have, say, two radial modes, and it goes to two radial modes. So two radial pumps goes to a radial signal and a radial idler. We could also have the case where we have um, a, a ra two radial pumps goes to an azimuthal signal and an azimuthal idler, and then um, where we have a combination. So we say have a hybrid and a radial shown here, and that goes to a hybrid and uh, another radial. So what's key, right, is that it, it happens in pairs, like I said. So either both pumps are in the same uh, cylindrical vector mode or um, one of the cylindrical vector modes of a pump matches with either the signal or the idler. And depending on the process, this occurs with varying amplitudes. And we there is also, so we only looked for the case of L equals one to kind of uh, simplify our analysis, but it is also allowed that we can have non-trivial processes. So we can convert between the different L values um, so for L is greater than one, say going from an L equals three to an L equals two, that was allowed. But what we have to remember in that case is that the radial distribution of the intensity is going to be different for each of those different L values. So that our overlap integral is not going to be, um, it's going to be basically reduced because we're not going to have as much overlap in the radial um, direction. And that's going to reduce the overall efficiency of this, these four mixing processes. And then finally, we looked at the uh, total angular momentum uh, modes. And so um, these uh, are not uh, eigenstates of orbital angular momentum and um, spin angular momentum. Um, so you think about it, right? If you have the Z plus mode and you're applying an, an L operator, an S operator, you have uh, a combination of two different values. So they're not gonna be eigenstates in that sense. Uh, so you can't look at them directly to see if um, L and S are independently conserved. But what we did find was that <clears throat> you could get non-trivial processes where you could interconvert between uh, j equals zero and j plus or minus two. So what this means is that if we had, say, on the bottom here, we had two z plus modes, they could go to a y two plus plus a y two minus. Or you could go um, from a, a z plus and a y uh, two plus goes to a z plus and a y two plus. So, you know, in, in each of those cases, you could think about it that, um, you you have the total angular momentums conserved, right? Because you have zero and zero, and this is plus two and minus two, or you know zero and plus two goes to zero and plus two. And can you say, well, is that the only rule that we have to abide by looking at these total angular momentum modes? And it's actually not true, um, because you do have instances where this J value stipulation is is uh, preserved or is conserved between the input and the output, but you don't, but the integral still equates to zero. Um, so uh, that is kind of the summary of, of all our findings in this case. Um, and we just published this last month in uh, Joseph B. Uh, so if you want to go through all the details, you could uh, look up our publication there. Uh, but as I had mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, Jeff, Ben, and I were all experimentalists. And so this has kind of set the guidelines that we want to set out for in, in terms of how we're going to approach this problem in the lab. Because now that we have where we could expect to see this, this photon generation. 
Uh, so I'll just uh, finish off with uh, what the experimental implications of this are. Um, so as I also mentioned, right, that these cylindrical vector modes are eigenmodes of um, weakly guiding fibers, ring core fibers. Um, so you could see, and so what these fibers are, right, is that we have um, a low index material on, in the cladding on the outside and in the central core, and then the high index um, in this ring shape. And so this, this, in this ring shape is where the electromagnetic field is going to propagate. And so you could think it's very well naturally suited for the propagation of these um, CV modes because they have this donut type shape. So it supports them. So we need, you need to have one of these um, ring fibers available um, to test it, and we do. And this is the one we had um, with us. And so these were, the, this is the specifications uh, in terms of the diameters and the refractive indexes of the, cl of the cladding and the, the ring core. And uh, some, some things that we noted was that um, this, classically, this works very well um, in the telecom C-band. And what I mean by classical is that, okay, we're going to pump the fiber, we're going to get the signal in either, we're going to look out on a spectrum analyzer, and we're going to measure it. And the reason why it works very well in the C-band is because when you, when you have this strong pump going through the fiber, you're going to get this bandwidth of, of RAM and scattered photons. And it turns out that when you're looking at the traditional phase matching of frequency and um, um, momentum that that the idler field or the the red to tune field is going to land inside the the Raman scattering bandwidth so that what that's going to do it's going to serve as a seed to basically stimulate the Fourier mixing process and then produce our, our signal field that's uh, blue detuned however um, depending on what kind of uh, limitations you have or what you want to achieve um, if you want to use pumps at say 1400 nanometers, this can be very tricky because the idly field is not going to be outside that ram and scattering bandwidth and you're no longer going to get that seeding process happening. So you're not going to be able to look on a, a classical measuring device to see if this Fourier mixing is occurring. Um, so you'd either have to set up a way more complicated experiment to look for single photons. And of course you have filtering issues you got to be aware of, or you need to have an auxiliary beam to seed the process. So either setting up with a super continuum source um, in order to just kind of see where you can get the Fourier mixing classically. And then once you do that, you could then set it up for a, a single photon generation looking for these entangled light beams. Um, so that brings me to the end of our of my work. Uh, I was working as a postdoc with uh, JSEP. Um, so just to summarize, um, so I introduced hopefully cylindrical vector modes, which was a type of structured light. And we're gonna, we want to utilize that as a novel source of photonic entanglement for Fourier mixing. And then what we did is we set out to, uh, before doing this experimentally, to find a set of selection rules of the Fourier mixing um, in terms of a ring core fiber um, uh, for three different types of modes, the simple Y modes, which are products of ang orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum, uh, the CV modes and the total angular momentum modes. And that, yeah, these would serve as the guideline for actually doing this in the lab. Um, so just on my last slide, um, as mentioned, I'm now, that was my position, my previous position, and now I'm at uh, Carleton University, and I've been going to be setting up my own, my uh, own research group there. So this is uh, just some nice pictures of Carleton. This is the Minto building where my office is located. Uh, I'm going to be doing quantum information technologies uh, with light, so it's kind of my research background. And I have a preliminary website set up, but it's still very much a, a work in process, but definitely intend to be working on it more as um, the summer progresses. So um, that takes me in, and I guess uh, hopefully we kept it relatively in time and could take questions. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Connor. Um, so now we open up to um, questions from our uh, home audience. Um, so just unmute and just start talking. Can I ask a question, which I uh, actually have a comment and a question. Um, the comments are uh, about interconversion between different uh, frequency scales. And I would like to advocate at something that was hinted at, which is Rydberg atoms. Rydberg atoms seem to me almost an ideal uh, medium for interconverting between, let's say, the microwave and the visible or even the extreme ultraviolet uh, ranges. And they have an additional feature, which I don't think is much appreciated, which is that the, uh, the decoherence can be probably quite easily controlled by uh, applying external magnetic fields, which will greatly change the m quantum number distributions, which enormously change 
uh, collisional cross sections. So I think that changing the M-state distribution at will with applied uh, magnetic fields is something that could really be used to tune decoherence uh, in these types of schemes. Um, again, getting back to atomic physics, uh, in Connor's talk, I kept thinking about uh, this has almost a one-to-one -one mapping onto uh, spin orbit coupling in, in AMO, AMO physics and the different um, uh, Hund's coupling cases, which is just different ways of adding together angermenta. And the case you described would be called the Hund's coupling case A, <clears throat> where spin and orbital angermentum are each individually conserved before adding them to make the total angermentum. So I think, I wonder if there's some profit there to be looked at how uh, spin and orbit angermentum are treated in AMO physics and, and the various coupling schemes. There's been an enormous amount of work, obviously, on that subject. My question is about um, something that I heard about first from Moshe Shapiro about 15 years ago, which is that he proposed another way to control decoherence, which is through continuous measurement. He argued that if you measure something over and over and over again, you keep resetting it. And I didn't hear this mentioned, at least in this talk, as, as an option, as a possibility. I don't know whether this works or whether it's practical, and I wonder if anyone had any comments on that. So those, those are my questions. That's three, three questions or comments. Uh, the last one was a question. Okay, the last one was a question. Okay, I, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't quite, I, di I didn't quite understand like what system you're referring to for the decoherence. Do you mean, do you, you mean like an atomic system there? So this is more for Ben than I think. Well, if you had, a, if you had an atomic river gas, I, uh, I believe that you could strongly alter uh, decoherence times by just controlling uh, the M state distributions, for example. You think about uh, uh, decoherence free subspaces and things like that? Yeah, so I think I think that's very interesting, and, and Chabad, I, who I think must be on here somewhere, may want to chime in too about what he's thinking about, which is more about, uh, you know, uh, interacting uh, Rydberg systems. But I, I, th I think I tend to agree with you that there's a huge variation there that, that one should be able to harness um, uh, for controlling decoherence. So Albert, I have a question for for you. you. You talked about the Rydberg atoms being used for converting between, say, microwave and, and something else. What um, is this like a four wave mixing conversion process, or is this a, a like you, you excite it and then they decay and emit the other frequency? Well, for example, you can start with a metastable atom. Uh, like you can easily yeah. make a high density of, uh, like, say, helium in the 6s state. And, and then through a visible light, you can convert this to Rydberg atoms uh, with well defined NLM quantum numbers. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden now you are one photon coupled to the ground state, which is a VV photon. And so it seems to me you have a very clear path between, you know, uh, visible or perhaps even microwave transitions because the transitions between Rydberg states can be in the microwave region. Whereas the emission of the photon uh, to the ground state, which is also a single sharp state and therefore has no phases, uh, it should be well defined, I think. So it seems to me an interesting way to convert between very different frequency scales. Okay, I'll have to think about that more. Sure. Okay, I see Ibrahim uh, has been waving his hand. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you very much, Ben, Jeff, and Connor. It was a fantastic talk. And I apologize for my voice. I have been sick. Um, <clears throat> oh. So uh, uh, um, I have a couple of questions and maybe uh, I don't like comments, <laughs> it's not comment. So uh, uh, the, regarding the, uh, the Jeff's talk, when you, when you, talk, when you consider um, um, the, the situation when you have the uh, crystal along the Z axis, okay? Uh, in that scenario, the beam, when it's coming, is not really uh, parallel to the crystal. What is happening, some of the rays, they come at the tilted angle. And what you see in that case is, I think we have a joint paper on this as well, you have some sort of spin orbit coupling. Mm -hmm. This is something that you may consider that. It, it, it plays role when you deal with, poli with polarization of light there. 
And regarding, uh, uh, I, I'm sure that it, it may not play a role in your experiment because you are not playing with the polarization. You only care about the mode and you care about the imaging plane. But if, if uh, the beam comes at a cer certain topology, then you may have additional lensing effect. And this additional lensing effect, because the symmetry that you have it is cylindrical symmetry, and the k-vector that they come, they will also have the cylindrical symmetry situation. So different polarization may be foc have focusing at different regions. Uh, that's the first question for you. The second question, Jeff, I will ask you later on, so you may address this. Oh, okay. So, so the yeah, there's definitely a connection between spin or it's funny because there's a there's a spin orbit coupling in Connor's work, but there's also a spin orbit coupling in the the space plate stuff. And we have not, I have not really put my finger on what exactly is the connection between spin orbit coupling and the space plate effect, but but it's already in there. So like we already take, it's already built into it. So we already consider all angles coming in and all and, and any polarization, and we know what it does to to all those states. So um, I, I'm not sure that any particular topology would do something different, um, but. But for sure, it is connected to spin orbit coupling in the sense that um, you want your, if you sent a ray through your crystal, then it should basically move to the side. And that's the kind of thing you see in systems with sim spin orbit coupling, these kind of ghost henshin shifts. And that's exactly what we want to happen in the space plate. Okay, so uh, I will come back to the corner uh, experiments and, and results. So uh, regarding the, um, what they call it, wavefront matching or the technique of adiabatic evolution of the phase font. So uh, uh, first of all, I have doubts that this is unitary action because in order to have a unitary action, you need the entire of the space and your system has certain numerical aperture. So it mm -hmm. cannot be unitary. And maybe in, in theory, if you say that I have infinite space, then yes. But indeed, this is based on changing the, the direction of the wave font. And in such a way that some of the wave, some of the light will be outside of your numerical aperture of your system. And then it's not unitary. Second, do you really need to do the action in the far field, near field? Uh, or you can do it in, in, in any intermediate region. So you don't need really, let's say, having a lens, they're going to the far field, applying some modifications there and coming back to the near field. So, okay, so your, your first question is, um, your system is, I'll rephrase it in a different way. So your system is embedded in a continuous infinite space. Like there's an infinite range of K vectors and, and position, well, particularly positions. And uh, as soon as you truncate that, like by the aperture of your, your optical system, then you're suddenly gonna be non-unitary. Non and I, I agree. And it's always gonna come down to a fidelity issue. Um, like how, how good is your unitary? How much loss does it have? And I just point out that these, these same questions apply to um, systems that we don't usually think about them in, for instance, those, those waveguide networks that people are quite comfortable with uh, implementing discrete unitaries, because those are also embedded in a, in, a, in a continuous space. So there, the modes are the modes in the waveguides, but it's still a continuous space. Like X is not stopped at the edge of the waveguide, X goes on forever. So, the, the, so there's gonna be some balance there that also applies to that, to that waveguide uh, situation. So there, another way of looking at it, there's probably some, some scattering in the waveguide or tunneling to a neighboring waveguide that you don't want. Uh, and it always comes down to, uh, to some, some limit you wanna be in. And uh, okay, the second question, can you just jog my memory? What was that about again? A near field, far field. Oh, near field, far field, right. Uh, so uh, do, you, do you actually need to go right to the far field and then, uh, and then back to the near field? Well, uh, ben, ben actually sent me this question by email too. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, you could actually even just implement the lens on the SLM. So you could, what we actually do in our experiment is we don't actually use a, a curved mirror anymore. We use a flat mirror. And the effect of the lens is, is built into the phases that you put on the SLM. And then plus, you're right, like the diffraction itself in the space um, mixes the modes as well. So that, as long as that's strong enough, 
um, then then it'll work. Uh, but there's a question of like, what is strong enough? And I don't think that's really known, like these kind of um, analytical arguments about what kind of setup will work and which kind won't is, is just not known, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to come up with an analytical. So you're talking about in, uh, using optimization for figuring out the phases. That's one of the reasons why we went and came up with an analytical formula for what those phases should be. Now, it doesn't exactly match on to the free space system, unfortunately, but it, you know, we're hoping that that line of uh, research will lead to some answers there. Okay, thanks, uh, Ibrahim, for your question. Now, Kabat, did I see you? Uh, yes, you did. Uh, yes, I do have a question uh, for, uh, it's a, this is on the general unitary uh, that, that Jeff discussed. Uh, if I describe each sort of layer phase shifters and uh, the, in your case Fourier transform uh, as one step and like and use that to quantify the depth, <laughs> uh, do you know how the depth scales as the like as for let's say for a fixed fidelity of like say ninety nine percent for the Fourier uh, transform case or for the beam splitter case. Uh, I think they're the, they will be the same, right? Uh, okay, so the beam splitter case, the de the depth is exactly um, what you think it would be. So you need n planes of phase shifters for n modes, basically. Oh, you so need it's n free parameters with the number of modes. Yeah, so you need n squared free parameters in your system. So you basically, you need n squared phase shifters in that in that network. And then for the Fourier transform case, well, up until what we did, everything was done via optimization. So that kind of question had nobody had an answer for. There were there were some analytical solutions, but they were existence proofs. So they were like really far from what you would think would be the actual this needed number of elements in your system or number of planes. In our analytical proof, we got as the closest that anybody has, and there's a factor of six overhead. So when we go from a direct mapping from the beam splitter scheme to the Fourier transform, we have a factor of six overhead in that we need to do six Fourier transforms for every plane. Now they're all they're all fixed, right? So you could, if you're actually doing this with integrated optics, you'd probably just lump them into one device that does their effect. Um, but if you actually do want to do it with a discrete Fourier transform or a Fourier transform, then you need six of them with fixed phase planes in between. Do you have an explanation for that factor? No, just don't have, just, we're closer to an analytical insight, but we're not there yet. Thanks. Okay, I see Ibrahim is back for another question. Yep. So, uh, Connor, this is for you. So a general story of spin orbit coupling. When you have, uh, when you are in free space, and you you are not in the paraxial regime. You cannot talk about the spin orbit coupling. Okay, the spin and orbit they are together. You cannot you cannot in, watch them individually. It goes back to Darwin's first theoretical proposal, and after that, a French scientist that they, they explicitly talk about this. When you have confinement, when you have uh, limited space, let's say in the transfer space, either in fiber or what, whatever you have a spin orbit coupling, you may have a spin orbit coupling, even in the lens system, or where you are in the paraxial regime. So that's a general statement. So in your case, what I see that spin and orbit, they are individually uh, conserved, which is, which is fantastic. I didn't think about that. But what is happening, uh, when I look at the integral, I have not looked at the paper carefully. So when I look at the integral, did you consider the Z component of the field? Because when you, when you do such confinement, your field is not any more transverse. And your field, it has a Z component of the electric field, which is, which is very unusual in the case when you are dealing with a free space. This is important. Second problem is when you deal with this sort of fiber, uh, Alicia spent two years with these fibers, so she can, she can talk a, a lot about this. These fibers, they're extremely strange. By itself, you have a geometrical phase additional to what you see here. You have additional geometrical phase which they decouple spin from the orbital angumentum. And that is, that is really annoying and you have to compensate for. 
So uh, it, maybe it comes as a comment, but did you consider the Z component? And moreover, did you consider the additional geometrical phases in your, uh, in, that your fiber may have it? Um, so the first question is, is no, we did definitely did not consider these, the Z component in the sense that we, we assumed that everything was transverse and that there was no um, uh, like longitudinal component of the electric field in that case um, for this, this analysis. Um, and then I could also answer that. I, we did, I don't believe we looked into the geometric group of phase either. Um, so I, I don't, could I ask for a bit of clarification, just because I'm actually very interested. Uh, what would, what would that, what, what is that, uh, the implication that be if you have that decoupling between the geometric phase for the spin and the orbital angular momentum? The two, the two states that you talk about, so spin mm -hmm. aligned or anti-aligned, right? They will have additional phases there, which is depending on the fiber, and as soon as you have a little bit of vibration or you change a little bit of the geometry, they will be they will be decoupled. So you will see them arriving at different timing, and that was I mean, Adisha spends two years on these essentially. And uh, finally, when we had the discussion with uh, Siddhar Ramachandra, Siddhar says to us, yes, Ibrahim, we just uh, faced this issue also in our laboratory. And it took, our, uh, took us also one year to figure out that. I can send you a paper that Siddhar exploit this uh, additional geometric phase. It's very annoying. If you work with this fiber, since you have a plan to work with this sort of fiber, I, I want to inform you. Okay. You may contact Alicia for further uh, clarifications. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Okay. Can, can I just clarify something uh, to do with Ibrahim's question? So the L, the L equals, so individually L and S are conserved in every case except L equals one. So in, in the L equals one case, they are not actually conserved. And you can, in fact, you can't even really talk about whether they're conserved or not because they're not good quantum numbers in the mm -hmm. sense that if you just start off with a mode that has a particular definite value of L and S at the start of the fiber, it'll have different values at the end of the fiber, even if you don't have this nonlinear interaction on. So they're, they're, so in that very particular case, which is the one we happen to be most interested in, they're, they're not conserved separately. Uh, and it's because you have the spin orbit coupling due to the, due to the interface, uh, like the, the, the interface of the cladding uh, and the uh, core. I see. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to uh, call this uh, to an end. Uh, this is the uh, last of our series, and so we get the rest of the summer off. Um, I should point out that um, we have recordings of these seminars on our website, extremephotonics.com, if you want to look at it in greater detail again. Um, other than that, uh, thanks everyone for coming and uh, enjoy um, the rest of your summer. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.